Let's examine some basic fluid properties using FET. Here's the link for the applet. This is a legacy application. You can run it in a Java emulator that runs in your browser, or alternatively, download the legacy Java version, which means you have to have Java installed on your local PC or laptop. I recommend downloading the legacy Java version. These two versions may be identical, but in my experience, there's often one or more missing pieces or features in the browser compatible version. If you can, try to download the legacy Java version. That's what I'm going to do here for this video. Okay, let's investigate the pressure depth equation. P equals P naught plus rho GH. Open up fluid density, gravity, turn on the grid, and completely fill up this tank. Place a pressure gauge exactly on the surface of the water until it reads 101.325 kilopascals. Very carefully note the precise location of this pressure gauge at that zero meters level. To me, it looks like there may be one pixel separation between the level line and the tip of the pressure gauge itself. Grab another pressure gauge and position it the same way at the one meter mark, maybe right about there. I'm trying to be consistent in my precise positioning. I have maybe a one pixel separation between the top gauge and the zero meter line and the same one pixel separation between the one meter line and the second pressure gauge tip. Add another pressure gauge and put it at the 2 meter mark and then add a fourth pressure gauge and put it at the 3 meters mark. So look at the pressure at the 0 meters mark and then at a depth of 1 meter, a depth of 2 meters, and a depth of 3 meters. You can see what's going on with the pressure gauges and you probably know from your own experience what happens as you go deeper. So this is how you'll collect your pressure and depth data. Data table one gives you three columns, one for water, one for honey, one for gasoline. Okay, your job is to now create an Excel spreadsheet and record this pressure and depth data. At a depth of zero meters, your pressure gauge read 101,325 pascals. Enter the pressure readings for a depth of one meters, two meters, and three meters. Now that you have this data, your job is to graph the results in Excel. Instruction number five says the pressure depth equation states P equals P naught plus rho GH and the equation of a line says Y equals MX plus B. Graph the independent variable on the X axis and the dependent variable on the Y axis. Use the slope of the line of best fit as the basis to calculate fluid density. You know what the answer should be. You know the answer should be 1,000. 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter is the density density of water. You need to find out how close you can get to this number using the data you collected from the simulation. If you have pressure P on the y-axis and depth H on the x-axis, you can see that the y-intercept corresponds to P0, and you can also see that the slope of the line corresponds to rho times g. So if you know the slope of this line of best fit, you know what rho times g equals, and if you know what rho times g equals, you can find rho by dividing by G. You know the density of water, honey, and gas is 101420 and 700 kilograms per cubic meter respectively. Your job is to see how close you can come to matching those values using the pressure depth equation and graphing techniques. When you're done with this section, hopefully you have an enhanced understanding of the pressure depth equation and reinforced your understanding of how to apply graphical techniques to get certain results. The complete version of the table you see here in Excel needs to be included with your submission. The next section is continuity, specifically volume flow rate. This is basically conservation of mass. For an ideal fluid, the rate of mass entering one region equals the rate of mass leaving that same region. Here I am in the flow tab. Let me make a few adjustments. I'm going to narrow the midsection of the pipe. I'll change the flow rate. I'll open fluid density and change from water to honey. Watch what happens when I click this red button to release a whole bunch of marker dots. 
They seem to be exiting the left side of the pipe at a certain velocity, but when they go through the constriction, their velocity seems to change. One thing is for sure, the volume flow rate has to be constant. If 10,000 liters per second is exiting the left side pipe, then 10,000 liters per second needs to be flowing through the constriction, and 10,000 liters per second has to be entering the right side pipe. That's continuity. I can monitor the flow velocity using these speed gauges. Here's the velocity of the flow as it exits the left side of the pipe. Here's the flow velocity going through the constriction. And here's the flow velocity as the fluid enters the right side of the pipe. I'm going to turn on my flux meter and put it right in the heart of that constricted area. While I'm here, notice that the flow rate here in this constricted area is still 10,000 liters per second. And notice that the flux is 12,732.4 liters per square meter per second. If I move my flux meter to the left side of the pipe, I still have that same flow rate, 10,000 liters per second, which is constant, but my flux is a much different 3,183.2 liters per meter squared seconds. Let me put the flux meter back in the heart of my constricted area. Take my speed meter, and again, for the sake of consistency, I want to put my speed meter right in the heart, right in the center and middle part of that constricted area, right about maybe there. So using all the tools and techniques at your disposal, you'll investigate the volume flow rate at the left side of the pipe and the volume flow rate through that constricted area and compare calculated predictions versus what the simulation itself says. These are good follow-up questions. Do your results in data table two validate the volume continuity equation? Please explain. And maybe even better, explain what changes and what remains the same as the water flows through a pipe that becomes narrowed at one point. The next section is the Bernoulli principle, which is really a statement of the conservation of energy. You can apply this equation to an ideal incompressible fluid that flows in a steady and viscid, and viscid means non-viscous, and irrotational, which means no turbulence, manner along a streamline. The Bernoulli equation basically says that the total amount of pressure energy density plus kinetic energy density plus gravitational potential energy density at any one point along a streamer is the same everywhere along that streamer. So the total amount of pressure energy density, kinetic energy density, and gravitational potential energy density here at the bottom left of this streamer is going to be the same as their sums here at the top right. Each individual term varies. For example, the pressure at the bottom left is different than the pressure at the top right, and the kinetic energy at the bottom left is different from the kinetic energy at the top right, and obviously the gravitational potential energies are different, but when you sum up all three of those energy densities, they remain unchanged, again, along a streamer in a fluid. I think everything is pretty completely and clearly laid out in the instructions. Maybe one reinforcement is to remember to use negative numbers for pipe depth because you are technically below what we're calling our baseline, which is ground level. Don't ignore that negative sign in your subsequent calculations. If you're patient and meticulous, you'll get really good results. Theoretically, the total energy density at that left pipe should be exactly the same as the total energy density at the right pipe. You'll do a percent difference to compare the two. So at the end of the day, hopefully you have an enhanced understanding of the interplay between pressure, kinetic energy, and gravitational potential energy in a fluid flow situation. <music>